on our website, so you can follow it there. And then the next Crossroads event is set for August the 11th. It will be co-hosted by Ruth O'Dell and E.J. Edney. Uh, the book they have selected is How to Be a, an Anti-Racist. Um, and we are very happy to say that we're co-sponsoring this book, I mean, this event with the Lafayette County League of Women Voters. Very happy about that. So welcome everybody. I'm glad uh, you're all with us. And uh, Barbara and Susan, uh, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay. Well, um, I first became uh, acquainted with Natasha Trathaway uh, last year when the University Museum sponsored a, a very interesting symposium focused on the Mississippi landscape. And um, Natasha Trathaway opened, it was a weekend uh, series of events and panels, uh, uh, art exhibition. And uh, Natasha Trathaway opened that symposium uh, by reading uh, her poems. And, and uh, as it turns out, most all of the ones she read were from Native Guard. And so it was really uh, wonderful to um, think about our conversation uh, tonight um, in rereading it. And I read it, I think about three times because I was on a long road trip, uh, but rereading it and hearing her voice in my head, that was really wonderful. And, um, and at the end of that evening last year, um, I, I met her. Uh, it turns out she and Susan are very close friends and it was a real treat to actually be introduced to her and have a few minutes to actually talk with her. But um, as I thought about our conversation uh, tonight, I went back to that symposium and the next day Jessica Harris was on a panel discussing Mississippi landscape and, and Jessica made a wonderful contribution to the whole event, I thought, when most people had been talking about, you know, the land and the delta and, and, um, and, and Jessica reminded us that there are, are many kinds of landscapes. Landscape is not just the geography. We can have landscapes of the heart. We can have landscapes of the mind. We can have, um, the, the landscape of our, of our interior uh, life. And, and it seems to me that, that Natasha Trethaway explores uh, the land as a landscape because the, her stories about uh, the native guards, the Louisiana regiment of black folks uh, serving in the Union Army, and their physically being on Ship Island, and what it was, what the experience was in being in that place, knowing the history of not only the Native Guards and, and how they were treated as Black men in the South in the Confederacy, but also how they were treated as members of the Union Army, and she tells some horrific stories about them and about other Black Union troops. And, um, but she also talks about the interior landscape, because you don't, you don't experience Ship Island the way she did unless you know the story of the Native Guards. And then she goes into an even more personal interior landscape and sharing with us her mother and her mother's death and her relationship with her mother, the, the deep love they had for each other, the, the lives that they shared, the, some sense of the tragedy of, of her mother's life. And that to me is um, you know, an interior landscape. And she's bringing this and, and that interior landscape happens on the land of the Mississippi Gulf Coast. So um, it just fascinated me that, that she talks about these different 
landscapes, um, all of which relay events and what she experienced and what has been experienced historically in a very particular place. And that what happens in, in this place of the Mississippi Gulf Coast imbues that land with indelible meanings. And, and, and um, for uh, several times, after reading it several times, I was confused about how she was melding her personal stories about her life and her mother with these wonderful historic uh, poems about what happened with na the Native Guards and, and other Black troops. And, and, but it came to me, I, I reread the whole thing after the Mississippi State Legislature voted to take down the flag. I wanted to see if her poems felt uh, different. And uh, they did in that, and in particular, uh, one line from, um, what was it? Um, that first poem in the book is about theories of, of time and space. Mm -hmm. And the line that jumped out to me reading it after the flag vote was that there's no going home. And, and, and what, I think that jumped out to me because, um, with the flag coming down, we're not going to go back to that place that used to exist in our interior landscape. And there's also a real change in the physical landscape because we're not gonna see this flag flying from uh, state uh, office buildings, from city halls. Uh, we're not gonna see that flag in courthouses and 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 so there that's a change in this landscape of all of all different kinds and but i wondered how she put these things together you know the stories that were so personal and then the story the historical stories and i decided that or i came to understand the collection as being about seeing and not seeing the full humanity of people. Um, not seeing the full humanity of the men who were in the Native Guards. Um, not seeing uh, her own full humanity being recognized by her history teacher. Uh, she has a poem in there, uh, Southern History, where she's uh, in high school, I think, and she's sitting in a history class and her teacher is, um, is talking about the glories of the old South and that it's going to be, and how happy the slaves were. And it's going to be a real treat for them to be able to watch um, Gone with the Wind. And, and the line she says in, 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 in that poem is that she's sitting there and she's listening to this and it's a lie my teacher guarded, silent, so did I. And I think she's there exposing, sharing that sense of complicity when you don't speak, when you remain silent and, and, and how that felt to her in that, in that classroom. So, um, I just think it's, it's, it, she offers us a wonderful way of exploring um, humanity and when we see it and when we don't and, and, and how we ourselves engage in that, in that process of being fully human and recognizing others. I just love that, Barbara, and it's, uh, it, it helped me. I had the same sort of struggle um, um, when I first approached this book and, and even, even up to, you know, rereading it for, for today that, um, how do the stories of, of her mother, uh, and the stories of the, of the troops, um, come together. And I think you really, um, identified that connection, 
um, I think her, her poems about her mother are just devastating. Um, and I don't know how you could not feel empathy. I don't know how you could not feel compassion for a young woman who's, whose mother is taken from her in such a violent way and not feel something. And in, in making us feel something, we're recognizing her humanity. And I think she makes that, I think she makes her own humanity the bridge to the native guard, to their humanity, because they've been ignored too. Um, and I, and I, so you're brilliant for help for looking that up as per usual. Um, and so I just always, um, I, I, you know, I'm a historian. And so Natasha is my favorite kind of poet because she, she always blends uh, history with, with poetry. And she talks about, as you said, this sort of um, the landscape of the mind, right? The way in which the physical landscape can shape and limit uh, or encourage um, various responses to it. Um, I think of it as a sort of, you know, especially here in the South, we live in an ecosystem of white supremacy because we're surrounded everywhere by, um, by, by, by tokens, by monuments that, that tell us, as she, she said one time, if you didn't know any better and you traveled through the South, you would think that the South won the Civil War because there are so many monuments to the Confederacy. Um, and then, of course, she lifts up the, 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 the people whose stories are not told. Um, so I was thinking about her a little earlier today. I, I had the opportunity to, uh, to teach a little session on the Civil Rights Movement to some young high school uh, students in Mississippi as part of the Winter Institute, Summer Youth Institute. And, um, you know, I didn't want to give them just facts and figures, um, that sort of thing. I didn't want to lecture at them. So... Um, we actually do this exercise in our work that uses the story of the Montgomery bus boycott. And we talk to students about, um, you know, that sort of mythic way that the, that, that the Montgomery bus boycott gets taught, right? And we all know it's, it's Rosa sat down, Martin stood up, and now everybody's free. Yeah. You know, right. that, that idea. And that's what still gets taught. Right. That's our sort of popular understanding. I mean, it's, it's getting challenged by movies like Selma and um, hopefully hopefully folks have been reading a lot more. I've, I've been, you know, told that people are buying new books about race these days, which is great. Um, but we I basically I put up on a on a whiteboard. Um, you know, I write up myth. And then I and then I write the reality. And so I, we talk about the myth and then I tell them the true story. I talk about Claudette Colvin and I talk about Joanne Robinson and E.D. Nixon. Um, I, I, I say she wasn't old because she was 42 and that's 10 years younger than I am right now. <laughs> so she was not this decrepit lady. Um, right. and she was trained, right? She was trained by Ella Baker at Highlander Folk School. Right. Um, it isn't that she was tired. Absolutely. Right. There, were, there was a plan. <laughs> it, was planned. it was planned over, over, over generations and, you know, the, the way that a community could, could rally from the moment of her, of her arrest to the following Monday, 35,000 black Montgomerians didn't ride the bus and they didn't have cell phones or tablets or laptops, right? That, that, takes, that takes planning and dedication and organizing, right? So, we, so I asked the students to tell me, okay, if the myth is true, how does social change happen, right? And they say, well, it's easy, you know, some charismatic leader comes along and, and, and saves you. It's spontaneous. Um, you don't plan for it. You know, good answers, right? And then I ask them, okay, if, if this other story is true, which we know it is, then how does social change happen? And so they say, well, it takes planning. It takes organizing. It's hard. There are consequences. You have to build relationships. Uh, it's about collaborative leadership instead of charismatic leadership. And then I asked them, now who benefits from the mythic story being told? And I think everybody that's on this call probably knows the answer to that. The folks that are, the folks that are in power are the ones that benefit from that story being told. And that's where I'm coming back to my main point, which is Natasha's work it not only just reminds us of the things that have been silenced, the things that have been deliberately forgotten, 
but it shows us why we have to tell the truth, right? Because if I'm just told that the only way I can make change is for some awesome savior person to come along and save me, then I'm going to sit right here in my house and never do a thing, right? I'm going to wait for somebody else to make a change instead of getting out there and doing it myself. And so um, what we tell, the stories we tell about history matter, right? Uh, the stories that we don't tell matter. Um, and so that's why she's so, I just love her work because she helps us remember who we really are and who we really could be. Um, and that's all of us being human beings, just like you said. So thank you. Well, we'd love to hear from folks that we can't see. Anybody chatting with us? You know, if you tap on the top of your screen or at the bottom, some little thing is gonna pop up and it'll say chat. And then you type, type away to us. And, and um, Al uh, Morse is going to read to us uh, what the chat is about. Hey there, this is Al. We're still waiting for a couple of questions, but um, if there is anything in particular you two would also like to address, maybe a specific poem that you didn't get an option to share about yet, and we'll let more people roll in with questions. Okay, well, well I, I would like to mention um, Jason Bolden's uh, con contribution uh, to that landscape symposium, because I think he and Natasha Trethaway um, uh, share something about the way they see landscape. Jason was, um, he, he, he is an, an, an amazing uh, person and, and an incredible uh, uh, portrait artist, as was his father. Uh, and he was, he was on a panel with folks who were talking about and he's from, the, he's from uh, Clarksdale, I think. He's from somewhere over in the Delta. He was on the panel with some folks talking about, you know, the Delta. And I have always uh, thought of the Delta as just a dreadful place uh, that's soaked in blood and misery. And, and I, I really don't like going over there. Um, and, and they were talking about the Delta in that problematic kind of, of way, the other panelists. And, and Jason just said, no, I don't, that's not my relationship with the Delta. My relationship is my grandparents' farm and my favorite tree is on that farm and my relationship is just very personal and it's about the lot, his life in that space created by his grandparents and parents. And I thought that was a beautiful thing. And I think Natasha, in the way that she shares her interior landscape, um, is, is, is dealing with place in that very same personal connection uh, kind of way. While she also does this whole other thing, you know, with, with uh, telling the history of, of uh, other folks. Yeah. But I, 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 I really, I would love to see she, she and uh, Jason Bolden have a conversation about that. Would be amazing. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was reading in, in preparation for today um, some of her interviews, and um, she noted one time that um, that W. H. Auden said of Yeats that Mad Ireland uh, hurt him into poetry. Mm. And so she says that Mad Mississippi hurt her into poetry, um, yeah. right? And I, I don't know how many people know, well, I mean, she's writing about it now, but um, she was 19, of course, when her mother was, was murdered by a stepfather whom her mother had divorced. And, and uh, you know, she was a student at the University of, of, of Georgia. Um, and somehow she was able to take that experience, that horrific experience, plus being born by racial and of all places, Mississippi, right? And turn that into something elegiac, right? I mean, she to turn it into poetry. She, she talks about the way that 
um, that every traumatic event she thinks can be transformed through the language of a poem, which is just another way of telling a story, right? So I, I love that Jason could tell another story, you know, that, that helped make the, the, the Delta come alive in a different way and not just a sort of a, a scary way. Yeah, I, I used to ask myself, you know, how can black people say that they love the Delta? What the hell is there to be loving <laughs> <laughs> about the yeah. Delta? And I used to wonder how Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer just just came up with the with the belief that the world was supposed to be different than that plantation she had known all her life and and how did she come to the idea yeah. that she could change the world and uh and it occurred to me as jason was talking about his relationship to the delta and as i think about natasha writing her poems that even in the ugliness of the delta and i grew up in the segregated uh, town of memphis tennessee mm. that, that there are bubbles within which we do experience our full humanity mm. even on a plantation you you know i think mrs hamer may have experienced in church or somewhere else um, that experience of her full humanity being recognized. And I think that um, now I appreciate that Black people have those moments in the, de even in the Delta, as I had those moments even growing up in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, that, that maybe those moments may be fleeting, they may be sustained moments. They may, may be related to a social interaction, or they may be related to church, but a person who, who has that in some way, this experience of being recognized as fully human, that, that's incredibly powerful. And I believe Mrs. Hamer some had that, those experiences and, and that is, and she decided to expand that bubble. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Hey y'all, we've got some uh, questions and comments. The first question is, I can't find their name, but they're wondering if you find poetry an effective way to tell a story and begin discussion. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, we actually use poetry uh, in our work. Um, we, we talk about it in the, in the field, folks talk about it as the third thing Right when it's some when you when you um, have a difficult topic to talk about sometimes it's easier to come at it sideways by by reading a reading or looking at a third thing like a, a film or or a poem um, and so we often will begin um, uh, a session or a retreat um, what have you a workshop with with poetry um, um, and conclude and. We, we believe in the power of it so much that we actually have participants write a poem. There's a great exercise that y'all probably heard of that, that, that um, some amazing teacher developed um, that, that uses the um, poem uh, Where I'm From by George Ella Lyon, who is a Kentucky Poet Laureate. Um, and it's a beautiful little simple poem about the, the, the things that um, made up her particular growing up experience, you know, the food and the smells and the sounds and the, the sayings. Um, and then we have people write a poem about themselves, you know, using that as a sort of inspiration. And, you know, I mean, every single person, when we tell them we're, they're going to write a poem, they freak out, you know, they get nervous. Um, and then they sit down and we give them time and it's quiet. And I tell you what, they come back and they just share these beautiful, beautiful poems. Um, so it's this amazing, and of course, they're also kind of practicing learning to be, learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? Sort of, they're nervous about writing the poem, but they do it anyway, and the sun still comes up, you know, it's okay. And maybe we can be nervous talking about something like race, right? And still come on through to the other side. So, so yeah. 
Barbara, do you have anything to add to that? If not, we have another comment and question. Let's, let's keep going. I think that's great. I don't think Susan and I both have to comment on everything. So Sounds good. Okay, so this next uh, comment and question is from Riley Morse. Um, <laughs> hey, Dad. Uh, so <laughs> my father says about 10 years ago on the Ship Island Ferry, we saw a half a dozen African-American Civil War reenactors. They were the native guard. The reaction of the white passengers was visceral and hostile. Nothing had really changed at the emotional level. When I came upon these poems, I thought about those scratchy wool uniform men who took part in that reenactment, and it was a revelation. And the question is got buried. All right. And he asks, how do you see the invisibility of the Native Guard in Mississippi history being changed in this moment? Mm. I think, um, uh, uh, in, in this moment, I'll, I'll, I'll take us back to um, the presentation that was made before the Lafayette County uh, Board of Supervisors about a, a week ago or so, more than a week ago, when members of the community, black folks and white folks, talked with the members of the County Board of Supervisors about why the Confederate uh, statue in the middle of our uh, town square should be moved. And um, they told uh, stories um, that made visible um, what their lives were like um, here in Lafayette County. Uh, Don Cole uh, uh, talked about what it felt like and urged the Board of Supervisors to let all of us be free. Uh, there was a young Black woman who spoke uh, about how it felt to her uh, having that uh, glorification of slavery. Uh, in this, at the center of our town, welcoming or not welcoming people. Um, and, uh, and people, um, Lin Linda Bishop talked about some of the real history uh, uh, behind the cause of the Civil War. Uh, what was the cause? Um, it seemed that, um, for some of those uh, supervisors, I think, did not know what language was in the Articles of Secession that were written by LQC Lamar, whom we honor so greatly. Um, but uh, so I think there was uh, truth telling about uh, history and about experience. Um, and and that's, that's happening in, in this moment sharing some truths. You know, I, I like quotes. Anybody that knows me knows that I like, I like quotes by, by um, smart folks, thoughtful folks out there. And um, James Baldwin is one of, one of the smartest. And he says, has said, if, um, if I am not who you say I am, then you are not who you think you are. Um, the sort of interrelated um, way we identify ourselves often by saying, I am, uh, I know who I am because I know I'm not you. Um, and having to, to grapple with that and rethink our identities. Um, and that's why it's so powerful uh, to lift up stories, lift up the history that we don't know, right? It makes us have to rethink um, who we are. And I know that that's frightening for some folks, you know? Um, they say that if a person feels their identity attacked, that it feels like a physical blow. Um, so I know that there are ways to to do it to try to to try to help with that to be a little a little more effective. Um, shouldn't have to be that way, you're right. Should should just be able to 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 grapple with the truth. But um, I'm hopeful that um, lifting up more of these stories will will cause us to really rethink who we are, right? To go back and actually learn who we are uh, as a nation. That it's not this just sort of glorified you know, we brought freedom and democracy to the world, right? It's a hell of a lot more um, complicated than that. And I know that there are folks who 
you know, they see the police brutality, they see the systemic racism, and, and then they see folks getting uh, really excited about bringing down statues and they get upset. You know, they say, why aren't we focused on police brutality um, instead of worrying about these statues? But I, but I, well, first of all, I think we can walk and chew gum. I think we can do both. Right. Um, because there are plenty enough of us. And then I think secondly, what, what Natasha shows us is that um, those monuments reinforce the, the, the false history, right? Before I, can, before I can create a world that is discriminatory and oppressive, I have to have the idea in my head, right? And so where does the idea come from? Um, so, yeah, thank you, Riley. That was a great question. Hey, we have a comment from Ruth Abdel that I think segues well. She says, in the poem Pastoral, she has a conversation with some folks at a bar, maybe, and she reveals that her father was rural and white. She asks, don't you hate the South? You hate it. Don't you hate it? Sorry. I assume, like all of us, our feelings are always more complicated than a yes or no question. And well, that's that. Um, that's that's one of the lines that that I uh, put in my notebook uh, uh, from after reading this collection. Um, you know, I was born in Virginia, raised in Memphis. Uh, the term Southerner always referred to the un, the unspoken word in front of it was always white uh, and uh, uh, but uh, I also I have a sense as Natasha has of of, of being rooted in, in the South this is my South um, and so I think uh, um, it, uh, th there's, you know, when people trash, mis one, one I, 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 I'm very uncomfortable with the chauvinism of Mississippi, of white Mississippians about that it's, you know, just the greatest place on earth. Um, but I'm also uncomfortable with the trashing of Mississippi as if, as if my people don't live here and, and, and haven't done, um, amazing things here. So um, uh, hating, hating the, the South is, is to me a very incomplete, it's an incomplete picture. It's, uh, it's uh, that landscape that I used to see when I would look into the Delta and see only um, uh, the, 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 the misery and, 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 you know, just, you know, 40 feet of topsoil being blood soaked. Um, I, I think it's important for our stories to reveal all of the South to us and all of ourselves to us. And, and there is so much beauty and, and honor and courage, uh, lots of ugliness to, to hate, but, but, um, so much beauty to see. Yeah. You know, I always, when I think about that question, uh, um, it, 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 it ticks me off a little bit, right, when folks ask us that, why you don't hate the South, because it traffics in this idea that somehow the South is the only place that's had problems, that the South is the only place that's been racist. And of course, that's just not, <laughs> that's just not the case. Um, all 13 colonies uh, uh, had slavery. Um, you know, George Floyd was more, was murdered right before our eyes in Minneapolis. You know, we could go, I could go on with the examples. I don't, uh, the folks on the call know that and Barbara, you know that better than anyone. Um, so that kind of, you know, like, I know it's convenient to say, well, as long as, we, like as we said in Georgia growing up, thank God for Mississippi, because if it weren't for them, we'd be less, right? Um, it's comforting, um, but it's not, it's not particularly historically accurate and it makes it, it makes it, seem easier to ignore the own there are problems in our own backyards for folks who don't live in Mississippi or live in the South. You know, the other thing is that 
of course, she's quoting um, Faulkner in that that poem uh, about um, not hating it. And for my own personal thoughts about it as a Southerner, um, I'm going to turn to another another Faulkner book, um, which I know the scholars think is not his best book, but I happen to really like it. It's called Intruder in the Dust. Um, and it's got this character in it, Chick Mallison, who talks about this moment um, well, he talks about how he wants the South to be perfect because he wants to stand with it perfect. Um, and yeah, I hope for that day. I want to stand with the South when it's, when it can be the best that I think it can be. That's wonderful. Um, so, so we've got a question from Becky Kelly uh, for Susan. She asks, in your work on racial justice, what poets or poems do you use? Well, we read Southern history. <laughs> uh, we read that poem by Natasha uh, a lot um, with, with young people and with, with, with adults, with teachers especially. Um, we use the work of Marge Piercy um, a lot. Uh, she has a poem called The Seven of Pentacles that's really lovely. It talks about... Um, how work has to be built underground like a garden you know sometimes you can't always see the connections that are happening in a garden and just like with people you can't always see the important connections and foundations that are being built um, and she has another phenomenal poem that i recommend to everyone on a day that you might feel like nothing can change and i can't do anything and i'm alone and how i feel about this and the, the world is always going to be just awful you got to go read the low road because it will pick you right back up um we use a poem called imagine the angels of bread which is you know that idea that before before you can hurt somebody you got to have the idea in your head and so what can we imagine uh that's transformative uh that changes systems and changes changes cultures that are discriminatory um yeah, those are the ones that are jumping to mind, but um, but uh, I, I'd be happy to put together a list of what we use, um, Becky, and share that um, with you and with anybody. That's wonderful. It looks like unless someone taps a question and presses enter real quick, we've actually reached the end of our questions. Um, I will pass it to y'all. Okay. Well... One of the things I was uh, thinking about as I was reading Natasha Trethaway's Native Guard uh, is, uh, is a, 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 a wonderful uh, thought that um, Susan and I are uh, friends with uh, James Lowen, Jim <laughs> Lowen, who uh, well, used to teach, he's a sociologist, used to teach at uh, Tougaloo College. and. Uh, he was my neighbor when I lived in Jackson, Mississippi, but, and he, um, he's been a, a, an expert uh, in a lot of uh, voting rights cases. Um, and I represented him as a plaintiff when he and Charles Salas uh, wrote this book on Mississippi history called Mississippi Conflict and Change. He's a wonderful person. And, and he said something that I think is, captures what what we're talking about right now and 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 this this is this is what jim says about knowing the truth about history he, he wrote a wonderful book several books but one of them is about you know the sundown towns um but anyway his take on all of this is that telling the truth about the past helps cause justice in the present and achieving justice in the present helps us tell the truth about the past. And I think we are really right in that moment, right now, here in Mississippi. Barbara, I was gonna share that quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good one. It is, it is worth repeating. One. So uh, do it with your voice. That'll make Jim so happy. Oh, I will. That's a great idea. Telling the truth about the past helps cause justice in the present. Achieving justice in the present helps us tell the truth about the past. So good. 
Isn't that great? Yeah. It looks like we do have another question um, from Joanne. Uh, she says, in that vein, what would be the top three books to read to help us understand racism? Thank you. Oh, well, I would say uh, to, tune in when Ruth Odell is talking about uh, how to be an anti-racist. Um, uh, I had heard a lot about that book uh, before uh, she told me she was thinking about using it. And so I went in and bought it at Richard's Bookstore and uh, read it on the way up here. And, and uh, I think that's just, it's, it's, it's a new, it's a different kind of framing uh, that is very helpful. So um, I, I think that's uh, right there uh, at the top of my list. I would also recommend that people uh, read this wonderful book, um, When and Where I Enter by Paula Giddings. And it's subtitle, the subtitle is something about, you know, something about, you know, black women in, in, the, in the history of the United States. Um, so I, I, I think those, those two books are, um, are really um, interesting and, and helpful. Uh, and I would say read the poetry of Langston Hughes. Susan probably has some more ideas about things that specifically target well, those racism, were anti-racism. Yeah, those were those were great. I, I, I always struggle with this question because I want to tell people 15, 15 books. Um, oh, I've got another one. The Warmth of Other Suns oh, yes. by Isabel Wilkerson. Yes. That's a great one. That's and you, then you could go to... Um, what you know the, the the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. There you go. Okay. Yeah, and I would only add. Um, I think there's some really good work out there on whiteness. Uh, I think David Rodiger's work uh, on whiteness I would recommend. Um, I, I probably will say something controversial. I know that there are a whole lot of people out there that like that book White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. Um, I'm not really one of them. Um, so yeah, I say that because probably a lot of folks have had that recommended to them, but um, my, my, my problem with it is that uh, it basically doesn't offer any solutions. It's sort of, um, this is horrible and uh, white folks are trapped in this system that we created, this system of white supremacy, but there's not really much you can do about it. Um, and not, it's, I don't find that very helpful. Um, so <laughs> just re read it. <laughs> Read it with that in mind, that, that if you pair it with something else that, that, that shows you some ways to do some things um, that are constructive. Yeah, like, like read how to be an anti-racist when you're sitting there being totally frustrated. Yeah, yeah or read so you want to talk about race, right? That's another, that's another good one. Um, yeah. I don't see any more questions, y'all. It's uh, yours again. Well, this has been great. Um, Richard, I, I applaud you and, and your folks at uh, Square Books for doing this. Al, you've been wonderful. I am a total Luddite around technology. And so you made this, uh, you, you, you uh, calmed my fears and anxieties. And this has been fun. It has been, you know, I always love getting to talk to you, Barbara, <laughs> especially about our, the, our favorite topics. Um, yeah. Mississippi and race and memory and, uh, and, and Jason Momoa. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, Richard, <laughs> <laughs> preferably over cocktails. Um, cause that's always a good way to talk about hard stuff. Um, well, and it's been great to engage with so many of our friends here. Um, although we can't see you all, it's been, we see your names. That's fine. We well, know I just want to say thank you to uh, both, both of you, Barbara and Susan, for a wonderful conversation. Um, so much insight um, and so many wonderful uh, recommendations of, of, uh, things to, to read and ways to be. 
path. So it's a very good conversation and sort of, uh, you know, I'd be surprised if we, if, if we can do better than this in, in another one. We'll, we'll see how Ruth does. Look, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, get ready for Ruth. <laughs> oh, yeah. She and EJ, that's going to be the power, power, power uh, combination right there. Yeah. And Richard, you know, this is this is what community building really is about. And, and that's what Square Books has been about from the beginning. And it's, it's just great to be a part of it. I tell people, you know, that's part of why I live in Oxford, Mississippi. Well, that's that's nice. It's um, it's always been rewarding in terms of the incredible loyalty uh, that uh, so many people have shown the bookstore. So. Uh, that has been great. At times like this, it, um, you know, we're right across the street from that statue. I look at that statue every day, all day. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've been feeling low uh, about that. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, thank everybody so much. And uh, again, I'll remind you that uh, Natasha Trethaway herself will be in conversation virtually with Ralph Eubanks on August the 5th, uh, Memorial Drive. Uh, Susan and Barbara both referred to that. And I, I read an advanced copy. It is, uh, it is, it is an amazing book. It's very, it's an incredibly tragic story and uh, difficult, but nobody could could write that story better, of course, than she. But, um, <clears throat> and also on August the 11th, Ruth o Odell and E.J. Edney will be discussing how to be a racist. Thank you, Al. Thank you all so much. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, one day when we're not wearing masks. Absolutely. Thanks, Al. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thank everyone for being with us. Oh, they're all, everybody's showing their beautiful faces. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Heart, heart, heart. Thank you. Take